Hey guys, it's me, Nerdventures, back at it again, beanie and all, to bring you another video. Unfortunately, uh, due to a po probably foreseeable on my part, major malfunction with the $10 uh, tripod that I bought, um, the setup has gone back to the original Nerdventures um, setup of multiple comic boxes stacked on each other and a phone wedged in there. And, uh, yeah, it's not easy, it's not easy to record, um, it probably won't, um, look as framed, although I don't think any of my stuff particularly looks super framed, but, um, yeah, I decided that we're just gonna steam ahead and do a, a little discussion video since I can't get the shots of the books that I wanted this week while I replace my, uh, crappy-ass tripod with another, hopefully slightly less crappy, slightly less assy tripod. So... Um, <laughs> what are we going to talk about this week? I wanted to talk about criticism and specifically what my take on being a, a critic of media and art is, and uh, that in relation to Batman vs. Superman, if that makes any sense, which I hope it will once we talk about it. The reason this is in my mind at the moment is because... I just saw Batman vs. Superman, colon, Dawn of Justice, yesterday, uh, and it is an interesting movie to me, not so much the movie itself, which I found profoundly disinteresting, is that the word? Uninteresting. <laughs> profoundly not interesting, um, but rather the dialogue and the sort of exchange that is going on around it, because in my mind this movie had a sort of inevitability to it, if that makes sense. Like, a lot of people that I talk to at work um, and, and other places, you know, even on the internet and stuff, like in comic groups, there was this sort of sense of once the reviews started coming out and the reviews were not kind to it, there was a sense of almost like, well, I'm going to see it anyway. Like, I have to still see it. I, it. I was always planning on seeing it. It didn't matter how bad the reviews would be. I still needed to see it. Like, it's still the next sort of capstone, like, cultural superhero capstone or, or whatever, the next, um, you know, pillar of superheroes in, in pop culture and media. And it felt to me, like, more than any other movie where I sort of had the sense of, you know, people, some people would like it, some people wouldn't. Maybe they saw reviews for Avengers or whatever it was, Ant-Man, and some people saw it and some people didn't. I felt like this one had a sort of sense of, of just, it was going to happen. Like, it, it, everybody was going to see it. Maybe I'm just totally making that up, but I just felt amongst, you know, in my personal experience, amongst the people that I talked to and were, were watched have conversations online, that there was this sense of, it doesn't matter how bad, like, the ship is sinking, like, I need to see what's going on on that ship. It just has to happen. And I think that that attitude fostered a sort of interesting... I don't know if war of words is the right term, but an interesting dialogue that was going on between people that saw it and felt like they needed to either defend it or needed to maybe justify their decision um, to have, having seen that movie and, and what they thought about it, if they liked it, because it has such a critical panning to it right now. I believe it's something like 30% on Rotten Tomatoes and 44 um, out of 100 on... Uh, Metacritic, so I tend to go with Metacritic stuff just because I like having the raw score data instead of Rotten Tomatoes being kind of like the percentage of, of which movie critics liked it or not, but regardless, it it was shit on by a lot of movie critics, and there came about this conversation or dialogue that was going on where a lot of people were saying that the critic, it was it wasn't made for the critics, it wasn't something that, like, of course critics wouldn't like it. It was made for the fans, for the people. Zack Snyder started this this odd, in my opinion, uh, type of, of argument where he basically said, in interviews, people were asking him, sort of tiptoeing around the question of, well, this movie isn't being received well, what do you think about it? And he kind of came off with this response that was, well, I didn't make this movie for a critic. I didn't make this movie for... Um, somebody who was like a cinephile or a, 
a an objective lover of cinema, I made this movie for the fans, for people that are passionate, for fanboys, because I'm a fanboy, and I grew up reading comics, and I love this stuff, and you love this stuff, and so we can geek out about it, even if the, you know, the man, the critic, doesn't get it. And that was kind of what was being put out and thrown around, and I think that that's a really mistaken and, and silly argument, because it's basically going against what I personally believe a critic is. And so that's why I wanted to make this video, is to tell you what, in my opinion criticism is and what to further clarify what I tend to and want to put out in this channel as or in my podcast or wherever I am um, as as my cr critical voice um, and to sort of argue against what he was saying because I don't think that fans and critics are different things like what he was is making is making this divide I, I don't think that that's true I think that Actually, fans and critics are often the same thing, and even if you're not a genre fan of something, that doesn't excuse poor movie making or poor construction of a of a uh, medium or art or whatever in lieu of pleasing fans. So let me first say, for me personally, I put a, a good deal of weight on critical scoring. What I mean by that is things that are not popular but tend to be well scored and well received by critics are usually things that I tend to be more interested in. Whether it's film or, or books or music, um, you know, especially with stuff like film, like indie film, I'm honestly not that interested in what everybody else is seeing. I'm more interested in finding critics that I resonate with or or sort of you know whether it be going to metacritic or wherever finding websites that that put forth critical um what's the word an amalgamation of of critical reviews and sort of being able to look through that and see what people are are generally recommending and the reason for that for me personally is to use a food metaphor is these people in general i would say critics whose either job or passion it is to put forth their opinions on on media or art or whatever it is in general i think that their quality of consumption is generally higher than the average person ergo to me things that they find to be quality i tend to trust more because of the baseline that most critics have so let me explain that with a food analogy <laughs> again. If you, if you have listened to the podcast that I'm on, Get a Cat, Get a Horse, when we were talking about Deadpool, I used this same analogy, so allow me to use it again. Uh, that is the cheeseburger analogy, right? Basically what I'm, what I'm trying to say when I use this analogy is anybody and everybody, probably, you know, in general, not everybody, I don't eat them, I'm a vegetarian, but everybody eats McDonald's cheeseburgers, right? And they're convenient, and they taste fine, they satisfy the craving, but they're more of a convenience consumption. You know, it's sort of like like putting on your favorite TV show in the background and just watching it and getting comfort out of it, or playing a game that you always play and getting comfort out of it, reading something you've read before and getting comfort out of it, or reading something that is, you know, meant to be consumed in an easy way. McDonald's cheeseburgers are meant to be shoveled down your face quickly, so that you, they can get the most money out of you and that you will come back and want more because you you have a comfort associated with it and it is, you know, satiating that comfort for a low price and it is repeatable infinitely, right? Every day you spend a dollar on a cheeseburger, it's just a, re a re repeatable habit. It becomes something that is part of your, you know, routine. I'm not saying everybody does this. This is just my example. But what that means, in my opinion, is let's say you get a cheeseburger now mcdonald's is on the it's like a one out of ten right if you get a cheeseburger that is a five out of ten every once in a while to the person that's consuming all of these one out of tens these convenience burgers that five out of ten cheeseburger is like oh my god it's so great right it's something that they can really latch on to and like but in the ultimate scheme of things i think it is not a good burger but in my opinion 
if your job was a critic to review burgers, then in general, you would have a wider spread of burgers between 0 and 10 in quality. You would probably not consume the one burgers all the time. You know, it's your job to go to restaurants and consume a burger that is a 3, that is a 9, that is a 4, that is a 7, right? So you have this range of, of sort of uh, burgers, right, that you've consumed... And when you see this 5 out of 10 burger, this new burger place that's opening up and everybody's loving it, you can go there and say, well, you know, it's a, it's a fine burger. It's not a bad burger. But, you know, this other burger that has all these weird ingredients and will push your taste buds and boundaries in these weird ways, this 9 out of 10 or this 10 out of 10 burger, this is what is, like, really amazing to me right now. As somebody who eats burgers for a living, this burger's you know, really cool. It's like setting, you know, doing different things with my taste buds. It's making me experience all these new and interesting things, right? Whereas somebody who doesn't taste burgers for a living, who's, you know, into the one out of 10 burgers and just eats McDonald's all the time and maybe occasionally springs for like a Five Guys burger or whatever, they go to the nine out of 10 burger, which is like, you know, weird and uses crazy ingredients and has all these different things. Something that makes somebody who is a burger aficionado love it. And they'll probably go, ew, this is gross, this is crazy, this is weird, this isn't what I like, this isn't what I expected. You know, there's a, I, in my opinion, sort of a visceral reaction to something that's outside of the realm of your normal consumption. So I know that's a long analogy, but what I'm trying to get at is, I believe that that carries true for all forms of criticism in art. I think most people, if you are sort of a, somebody who goes to see Hollywood movies and goes to see... Uh, you know, watch whatever's on TV, CSI or whatever. Most of those things are convenience consumption. Um, they are sort of meant to take up time, meant to bring you into franchises, meant to bring you into series, meant to keep you as a lifelong fan of those things. And when there are unusual things, say indie stuff, lo-fi, uh, foreign movies, you know, non-English language, black and white, comics, what, whatever it is, when there's independent stuff being published, the reaction to most of those people is like, oh, that's different than, you know, that's weird, that's outside of what I like, that's not really my thing, you know, that's not really my thing, but if you're somebody who, who's, you know, either passion or job, like for me, my sort of passion is to consume this, this widespread of, of film and television and, well, not television so much, but film, let's say, games, uh, books, comic books, if that's your, like, thing and your desire is to sample this whole array, then I think you get a, a better understanding of, and a better definition between, like, you know, this spectrum of things that you consider to be good and bad, and you stop rejecting things out of the notion of, oh, that's different and that's strange, and start instead, you know, consuming everything on this spectrum and seeing where you fall in the spectrum and where you like it. I'm not saying that if McDonald's is your favorite cheeseburger, that's cool. That's great. <laughs> Go eat McDonald's all day long. Like, if you like that and love that and that's your favorite thing, that's fine. I think the problem is when people start to get this idea that the criticism and everything is is totally objective and you're starting to say, well, McDonald's has the best burger in the world, obviously. It has the best burger, right? I mean, it is the best burger. I think that that is not something that a critic should or can ever say. I think what they can say and should say, in my opinion, is that McDonald's is my favorite burger they should be able to lay out the reasons why they like it. And then that should either, A, resonate with you. And you say, yeah, I those reasons are good to me. I'm going to go eat McDonald's too. Or B, not resonate with you and say like, oh, you know, the reasons why that guy likes it, that's the exact reason why I don't like it, so I'm not going to try it. So dropping the cheeseburger thing, I think as a critic, that is my job. I don't believe in objectivity of critics. I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's something that you should strive for I think critics should be subjective. Absolutely. You know, I have no pretense of reviewing a movie and saying like, oh, you know, I didn't like the the subject material. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of this, but objectively I can see that it does X, Y, and Z. Ergo, it gets 7 out of 10 because objectively it is a 7 out of 10 movie. That's not the way that I perceive the way it should be or how I ever want to do it. My entire goal, and I think the whole point of criticism, is to establish aesthetic, 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 signposts, 
and to guide people through those signposts of what you personally, what I personally enjoy and consume in order to give you an understanding of my general tastes, my general opinions and, and tendencies towards things. So that way you can watch my th content if you desire and choose whether A, like I said, it resonates with you or B, it doesn't. You know, I don't purport to have some objective idea about what is good and bad in the whole grand scheme of rating things out of zero to 10. That's not my goal. You know, my goal is to say, I like, you know, David Lynch as a director, uh, Hayao Miyazaki as a director. I love Pavement as a band. I love Wire as a band. I love Joy Division as a band. I also like um, the TV work of whoever, writer Aaron Sorkin. I don't, you know, particularly, but I like that. And I like the paintings of this person. And I like the comic book work of, you know, Grant Morrison and this guy. Like, my goal is to give you this understanding, paint you this landscape of what my tastes are. And then with that in mind, every time I post a new review or a new comment on something, you know, you can look at it and say, oh, you know, I agree with Will. Uh, this landscape, this aesthetic landscape that he's laid out the, with these signposts are something that is resonant to me. And then I'm going to follow, you know, him along and listen to what he has to say about this. Or you could find one of my videos and go, this guy is a total fuckhead. Like what? There's no, he has no idea what he's talking about. I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm not going to listen to him. That's cool. That's perfect. That's great. That's the whole point of criticism, in my opinion, is is not to look at it and say, well, IGN gave a 6.9 out of 10. Who in IGN reviewed it? You know, who was the writer who reviewed it? Or Pitchfork gave this an, a 10 out of 10, best new music. Well, who was the writer who reviewed it for that, you know, for that outlet or whatever it is? It's not so much about, like, having this monolithic, thing that gives scores and gets put on Metacritic, it's about saying, well, okay, so this one person reviewed an IGN, they also reviewed these 10 other games. Oh, they gave these games scores, like, that are here, but to me, those games were maybe 8s or 9s when they gave 4s or 5s. Ergo, when they review this new game and they give it a 10, you know, maybe for me, it's not going to be a 10, because I disagreed with their past aesthetic choices and preferences, right? That's what I'm trying to build with this channel. I'm not trying to build a Nerd Ventures thing where you can go on to some database and see that Nerd Adventures gave this comic a 10 and that comic a 6 and that comic a 8. That's not my goal. My goal is to set up a, like I said, a, a dialogue and a conversation where in every review or in every piece that I talk about, I sort of piece this item together into my aesthetic understanding and say why I like it or dislike it based on that. And then it's up to you as a you know, thoughtful consumer or reader or listener, watch or whatever to look at that and say, you know, well, I also like this, so I'm going to like this or I don't like this. So I'm not going to like it. You know, that's my goal. So what I, I'm talking about with Batman vs Superman is when he's creating Zack Snyder, that is, is creating this whole dialogue about, well, you know, fans like it, but critics don't. And so, you know, the people should go see it because the, the critics are all snuffy and, and they're, you know, up their own asses and they're not going to give a good a superhero movie a good rating. You know, maybe that's true, but, but that doesn't really make sense because if you're a fan and you have this aesthetic feeling of, of loving superheroes and the whole, like, genre of filmmaking that is superheroes, you, the critics that you should be pulling from are critics that also have similar tastes to that, Right. If you gave me a country music album and asked me to review it, I would give it a shit score. That doesn't mean that everybody, because I don't like it. I personally, it doesn't fall within my range of things that I enjoy and that fits into my you know, understanding of, of art and what I like consuming. But country music fans shouldn't come to me as a critic and say, well, what do you, Nerd Ventures, think of this country music album? Because I'm going to give it a shit score. They should go to people who have criticism and, and understanding and knowledge of that area and like that stuff, and then can compare it within the genre and within the aesthetic you know, tropes of that particular item. So when you're going out and you're looking at Batman vs Superman and you see, oh, it has a 44 on Metacritic, that shouldn't really matter. In my opinion, what should, what should matter is you finding a few sources, maybe a handful, maybe a dozen, whatever, a few sources that you find resonate with you 
and looking to see what they say about it. It's not about getting this entire big picture idea or about, you know, seeing, oh, well, People Magazine said this or Time Magazine said this. It's not about that. And if that's the way that, you you know, you're getting the the recommendations is just from these, like I said, these monolithic entities where it's just kind of like what is popular today, that is not, to me, the definition of a nerd. It's not smart consumption. Like, when I think about nerdiness and I think about smart consumption, I think about, like I've try been trying to say this whole video, um, creating that aesthetic understanding and preference sort of list, or not a list, but a... a a general idea of what I'm into and then finding other critics and other people who are also into that. So we can discuss things that we, you know, find alike when you're talking about these, these ideas of, of critics reviewing things that aren't in their fandom, then basically you're, you're just missing the point. In my opinion, it's not, that's not what you should be looking for. You shouldn't look and say, Oh, the critic who gave a 10 out of 10 to the documentary about, I don't know, killing in Indonesia, right? Somebody who loves that. And then turns around and gives a 3 out of 10 to Superman and says no adult should watch, you know, superhero TV shows. No adult should read comics. Why would you even look at that as part of the critical, critical uh, you know, eye that matters to you? You know, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to you personally. You should be looking at things, in my opinion, that have an understanding and resonance to you. I know I've used resonance like a million times this video. And you should be using those to determine what you feel is a good consumption to you and not looking at any general scores and general places and without, you know, reviews without names on them and just saying, oh, it didn't get an eight, so I'm not going to see it. I hope this made some sort of sense. I think it did. I think it did in my, you know, listening to myself talking this entire time. But basically, I just wanted to get my thoughts out there and I wanted to put this out as as a genu general idea and a mission statement to what my goal is. You know, my goal is just to give you an insight into Will's brain, into just my personal likes and dislikes. I'm never going to review something in an objective sense and try to, or I shouldn't say never. I don't plan on it. That's not my goal. My goal is to just boot up a camera, talk to you as if you and I are here having a discussion about it, and then for you to get an idea of why I liked it, and then for you to decide whether or not you want to check it out based on that. You know, I'm, I am just here to give either recommendations or, you know, thing, things that I would suggest to steer away from. Just, but just because I say I don't like it doesn't mean you shouldn't like it. Just because I say I love it doesn't mean you should love it. That would be so boring. You know, if everybody had the exact same um, tastes in art and music, then everything would just be produced the same. And, you know, if everybody had my exact same taste in art and music, that would be awesome to me. But there are a lot of people it wouldn't be awesome to. Like, if everybody had the exact same taste in art and music as somebody who, you know, loves, like I said, CSI and, and country music and whatever, like, that would kill me. Like, I would hate that. And I don't want that to be the case, where everybody feels like they should have the same taste as some, you know, general critic or whatever. Just find the critic that you like and that you feel represents your feelings on art and music generally. So when new things come out or they recommend or, you know, steer you away from new things, it is something that you can take to be more personal and more uh, appropriate to you. That's all I'm trying to say. So in my plan with this you know, channel, I know this has been like a 25 rambling minute video. My plan for this channel is just to give you my personal opinions, my ideas, my feelings on these comic books, films, whatever it is that I tend to review. And if you like in general and agree with my aesthetic preferences, then, you know, please check out all the things that I have. If you don't, that's cool too. That's all I'm saying. That is all I'm trying to say. I don't try and purport or I don't purport to be objective in any sense. This is just my personal opinions. This is my idea of criticism is using a lot of, of first person and, uh, not first person, a lot of uh, me-centric reviews. You know, I'm, I'm always going to say, I feel this, I feel that. I'm not going to try to couch it in some bullshit objective pronouns to make it seem more universally true. No. This is me. This is Will. This is Nerdventures. I'm going to give you the stuff and the content and the reviews and the discussions that I find relevant and interesting to me. And I hope that there is a community, I know there is so far a community of people out there who share an interest and a desire to learn and grow and consume stuff 
the same things that I do. So, you know, I'm always looking to increase my horizons and, and consume all kinds of interesting things. So if you want to follow along with me, please do. Um, you know, I'm here to tell you what I think. I want to hear what you guys think. And that's it. That's as simple as criticism is to me. It's just opinions and it's just finding whose opinions you feel that you can trust. So I hope you can trust my opinions. If you do trust my opinions and you would like to see more of this kind of content, please hit the subscribe button. Look at that transition. I'm like killing it today. Please hit the subscribe button. Um, there will be more content like this, more subjective eye-based content where I will tell you my personal opinions on, on different comics and other things like that. Please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Please give it a thumbs down if you thought it was rambly and strange. Uh, as always, you can find me on Facebook, Tumblr, and uh, also uh, my podcast, Get a Cat, Get a Horse, on Facebook and iTunes. I'll have all the links to those in the descriptions below. Hopefully my uh, tripod will be more functioning next week. Probably a new one will be replacing another $10 tripod. And then we will get back to more new and exciting previews, reviews, coverage, discussion questions, all that good jazz. So thank you so much. I really appreciate anybody who has taken the time to listen to this video or has ever commented or liked any of my things and, and you know, shown me that there is a group of people out there who are interested in the opinions that I have and that have a share, a mind space when it comes to art and media and consuming these things. And, and we want to, you know, talk and, and go back and forth on this. And I love that. That's exactly what I made this channel for. And I'm so glad that, that, uh, anybody is out there watching. Thank you so much. I'm glad that we've connected and I hope we continue to connect and grow the community because I love hearing your opinions and I hope you enjoy hearing mine. So that's enough rambling for today. Um, Batman vs Superman, by the way, you know, I fell asleep. <laughs> so there's my little mini review. I hope you guys have a great week and I'll see you next time.